thanks a lot. So very nice uh, of you having me here. Um, I'm talking today about uh, Carbine Stack, which is an open source project that we have started yeah, nine months ago, roughly now, uh, back in uh, 2021. Um, it's about computing on encrypted data. Um, you introduced me very well. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'm a research engineer at uh, Robert Bosch GmbH. I have a background in distributed systems, did my PhD a long time ago on that subject. And nowadays I'm a maintainer of, of uh, Carbine Stack, uh, but we're also working on other privacy preserving computing technologies. So a few words about Bosch. So we are a really big company, 400,000 people worldwide. Um, we have uh, 440 subsidiaries all over the world. That becomes relevant later on. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Um, we also have a, a big research department um, where we look into all kinds of technologies uh, that is uh, relevant for our business uh, fields. And these business fields, you may know us as the world's biggest automotive supplier, but we are also active in, in various other domains, including, for example, consumer goods. You might have a washing machine or a dishwasher from Bosch. Um, but that, that's all about uh, what I want to say about Bosch. Um, the agenda for today is I will first give a motivation what Carbine Stack is, uh, why we do it in an open source context, um, why we do it at Bosch uh, in general, which might be surprising. Then I give an overview of what Carbine Stack is, uh, uh, how it works architecture-wise, and also give an example based on the computing component of it. Uh, and then finally, I give an outlook what what comes next and 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 a summary of what you have heard so far. So starting with um, with uh, the motivation part. Um, Privacy preserving computing technologies, what is that? I always use this analogy. You might know these glove boxes from laboratories. Um, in, in the metaphor I use, the, the data within that glove box uh, is what is, can, can be dangerous, for, for example, for compliance reasons, because there is IP in it that you don't want to uh, get, uh, get lose control over, and so on. And then you have your hands in that glove box, which are kind of the algorithms that you use to manipulate the dangerous substance, the data, uh, but you have full control by having this uh, uh, contained uh, container where the data lives in. And so when you look at privacy preserving computing technologies, they allow you to seal computing environments and giving you a couple of guarantees. The first one is confidentiality. So uh, the data that is uh, worked on using privacy preserving computing technologies is, is protected from being manipulated, uh, is uh, protected from, from being extracted from that secure environment. And also you have full control over the data, meaning that you would decide what algorithms might uh, access the data and what actually leaves that glove box uh, to, the, to, the, to the outside. Why is privacy preserving computing technologies important? So there's a lot of text on it. You don't have to read it. I uh, just want to make clear that there is a lot of momentum in this, uh, in this technology at the moment. So the, the main drivers are we had 2018 the introduction of GDPR in Europe, but nowadays you don't only you only you not only uh, have GDPR, but you have similar kind of regulations in 80% of the countries of the world. And for a global uh, company like Bosch, of course, that creates a lot of friction because we have to comply with all of this, right? And privacy-preserving computing technologies, with the high security guarantees it gives and the privacy guarantees it gives, helps us to deal with this all of these. Uh, different um, uh, laws and regulations uh, in a kind of a, uh, a consistent way. The second thing is, um, Apple is a good example for that, uh, privacy and security are becoming success factors. So people are aggressively using that to uh, support their, their product strategies. Um, it's not only on consumer goods, but it's also in, in the industry uh, overall. So you, you have an increasing degree of collaboration between companies and whenever you collaborate on data, you have to make sure that you are compliant in terms of regulations, you have to make sure that the IP that might be contained in that data is not leaked and you don't lose control over that. So there are a couple of studies and findings that support that companies that adopt already today privacy preserving technology, computing technologies have, have better chances to survive in digital markets. And finally, uh, when you look at the industry, 
Uh, you see there are a couple of organizations coming up. So you have the Confidential Computing Consortium that looks into confidential computing in particular, and you have the MPC Alliance, which is Bosch, which Bosch also is, is a member of, uh, that uh, tries to support and establish uh, a good ground for uh, secure multi-party computation. So the bottom line is uh, privacy-preserving computing technologies has a lot of momentum. Uh, it can be used as a compliance enabling technology as a trust enabling technology with your customers or partners and also in a collaboration enabling uh, has a co collaboration enabling uh, role so uh, get, let's get a little bit more concrete what are privacy preserving computing technologies on a technical level so we have uh, more or less uh, three classes the first one is and we will talk about that today Computing on encrypted data. So you may have heard of uh, homomorphic encryption, for example. I think there is the, the, the most hype around that at the moment. But there is also secure multi-party computation, which is the topic today. And the, the, the main and the unique characteristic of computing on encrypted data is, as the name implies, uh, the data is encrypted all the time, even during use. Um, and that is kind of a game changer, and that's why it's considered as the holy grail in security, and that's also the, the, the motivation for the title of my talk today. Um, next to that, we have confidential computing. That's, uh, you have my third of Intel SGX or AMD SEV. So that's a hardware-assisted um, technology where you can create a very tightly controlled um, uh, protected areas on your CPU where you can put your data in and then process it and then later on uh, store it out again. The difference between computing on encrypted data and confidential computing is that confidential computing actually doesn't uh, keep the data encrypted all the time. So when it comes from memory, it gets decrypted and then worked in the clear on the CPU and then later on uh, encrypted before being written to memory again. That has implications. Uh, so the first one is it's much more efficient than computing on encrypted data because you don't have to use these very heavyweight cryptographic techniques. Uh, but the other one is uh, it is that the fact that you decrypt the data before processing it opens up um, vulnerabilities in terms of side channel attacks, for example. So you can monitor, for example, the, the, the power that the CPU consumes. And based on that monitoring, you can uh, derive what the original data is that has been processed within that uh, secret environment, which is not possible with computing on encrypted data. And finally, uh, we have statistical disclosure control techniques. These allow you to control what happens with the data when it leaves these protected environments. So you might have heard of differential privacy, for example. That's a mathematical method where you can uh, ensure that what leaves the data doesn't allow you to make conclusions about the original data that has been processed and makes mathematical guarantees about that. Today we will talk about, as I said, computing on encrypted data and secure multi-party computation in particular. As you see in the chart below, uh, it's very secure, as I said, because data is uh, encrypted all the time, but it has its problems still. So the cost efficiency is not too high, uh, maturity is not too high at the moment, and uh, also the usability. I will come to that uh, in more detail later on. Um, so next question is, why do we that at Bosch? Um, so we have a lot of use cases where we uh, have to comply with regulations, as I said before, and we have a lot of use cases where we want to collaborate with our partners. Examples are where we use confidential computing because of performance requirements is AI data pipelines. So we are developing systems for highly automated and autonomous driving. And for doing that, we need a lot of data. And that data typically comes from cars that are driving through the streets. And on, the, on these images, you have people, other cars with number plates and so on. And that's sensitive information considered personal identifiable information. That's the reason why GDPR applies. And then we need to apply the most uh, secure technology that is considered state of the art um, today. And that means uh, we are looking into how we can uh, use confidential computing technologies for doing that. Another example is simulation. So uh, modern uh, um, car consists of 200 microcontrollers plus, and um, you cannot, uh, uh, because change is the normal thing, right? So you have to update the systems all the time. And what you can do today um, is uh, drive around and validate the systems by, by doing that. You have to do a lot of simulations to do that. But that uh, creates the, the problem that the models come from different vendors, and the vendors don't want to expose their IP uh, to, for example, the simulation uh, environment provider. And that's the reason why we look into how we can computing uh, confidential computing techniques to protect these models. Um, now, for the computing on encrypted data use cases that we have at Bosch, I will give uh, only one example. It's about people analytics. I have t told you on one of the first slides that we have 
uh, subsidiaries in four, over 400 countries. Uh, 400, we have over 400 subsidiaries in uh, over 60 countries in the world, and our human resources department would want to understand on the big picture, right? So uh, why are people leaving Bosch, for example, when looking at the whole workforce of Bosch? And uh, since these are independent companies, there are regulations that kind of make that difficult to collect all the data in one place. And um, we, we look into how we can use these computer and encrypted data technologies to allow for this kind of use cases. Because with these technologies, the act actually the data doesn't leave the, uh, the premises of the, of the data owner, um, which I will explain in a second. Yeah, so secure multi-party computation, what is that? Um, so you typically have two or more parties that want to do a joint computation on a data set that is comprised of uh, sub data sets that come from here in that case Alice and Bob and they want to do a, a computation on top of the joint data set and uh, but they want to avoid that the, their own data set is exposed to the other parties and that's exactly the use case for MPC protocols they allow you to do that computation without exposing that data to the other party using cryptographic uh, methods um, there are upsides and downsides of this technology uh, so first of all um, the upside is uh, data is encrypted all the time. So even if Bob gets hold of the data, it's encrypted and he cannot use it. It has provable security. So in contrast to the trusted execution environments or the compu um, confidential computing techniques, um, uh, yeah, it's mathematically sound. You can prove that they are secure. That's why a company called Unbound Security uh, made a phrase math over matter, uh, which is a nice sentence. Um, and you don't have to trust anybody. So in that case, Alice has only to trust his own infrastructure, her own infrastructure, but not the infrastructure of Bob, which is kind of a nice feature. Uh, the cons, um, there are um, all, uh, still many of them. So as I told already, there is large computational and commutation overhead uh, required here. And um, there is, um, as of today, no uh, enterprise-grade MPC stack available. And that's the reason, by the way, why we started the Carbine Stack um, initiative, uh, which we will go into more detail in, in, in over the next slides. So what does uh, enterprise grade mean? Um, so there are a couple of uh, properties that you want to have for such a system. Uh, I think in the, in the upper row you are very well aware of, of that uh, property, so I will not go into detail here, but let's focus a little bit on the lower row. Um, so the first thing is efficiency. So as I said, there are large overheads and we want to make sure that under the constraints of the technology, we, we want to keep the cost as low as possible for using it. Integration means that's a whole new computing paradigm, but we don't want to set up a known infrastructure for that. We want to reuse what is what is available there already. So you don't have to set up your second data center just to support MPC. You can just use what is already there. Versatility means um, we had these different use cases. So what we don't want to do is set up an infrastructure for each of these use cases, but having one versatile stack that can be used for, for tackling all the challenges within these use cases. Simplicity, as you will see, it's quite a complex stack, so uh, we, we want to make sure that under the constraints of that stack we want to keep it as simple as possible. And finally, security. Um, it's, it's not only that you use secure multi-party computation, which is a secure protocol by definition, but you have also make sure that it integrates well with the other IT security aspects that, you, that are relevant in your business. And now, the good thing is... Um, there is cloud native uh, computing, uh, cloud native technology available. Looking at the definition from CNCF here on the right, you can just by using keyword uh, pattern matching, you can you can just identify a lot of the things that have been on the last slide. Um, I will not go over there. There is uh, unfortunately no mentioning of security in the CNCF definition, but when you look at the ecosystem, there are a lot of uh, relevant projects in, in available. Um, on the left side, you can see all the technologies that we use in, in Carbine Stack. At the moment, I will also later on discuss a little bit where the different components play which role in Carbine Stack. Final question for the motivation, why, um, this, why we decided to do that in an open source approach. Uh, there are many reasons. I will just highlight two of them here. So the first one is, when you remember one of my uh, previous slides, there was a site from Gartner saying that over 50% of the companies uh, of the world will use PPCTs in the next years to solve collaboration and compliance issues. So the idea here is, if they have the same problems, 
let's build the enabling technology together, right? So and share the the risk and and uh, cost of of doing that. And the second thing is um, increased trust. So. Uh, in particular, in the security area, it's a good idea to uh, open up all your code for public review. In open source context, everybody who's interested can have a look and decide then based on what he, uh, she or he sees whether it's good enough or not. Um, and in that context, um, it's, it makes a lot of sense because when you say the protocols that we use can be proven to be mathematically secure, there is no value in it if you don't demonstrate that you actually implement these secure algorithms in your code. And with the open source approach, people can have a look and, and uh, decide on their own whether that fits or not. Okay, that was the motivation. Now come into, now let's talk about what Carbine Stack actually is. So I guess a lot of you have already an idea of what we do. We combine uh, cloud-native uh, technology with secure multi-party computation frameworks um, and then uh, get Carbine Stack. Cloud-native means we have enterprise-grade processing at scale capabilities. MPC frameworks means we can keep the data encrypted at all time. And as a result, we then, uh, with this simple equation, we have enterprise-grade always encrypted data at scale. That's the idea. Is that a good idea? Uh, we think yes, and also others are also of this opinion. So on the lower left side, you see um, a picture from, from Gartner as well. They did a prediction which technologies will be relevant for, for digital companies in the future to, to be successful. And you see there privacy-enhancing computation, which is another word for privacy-preserving computing technologies. And you see cloud-native platforms there. And that's exactly what we do with Carbon Stack. <clears throat> so, uh, to understand the next slides, you have to understand a little bit how uh, secure multi-party computation works and what, what are the implications on the architecture. So, first of all, this is multi-cloud. So, typically you have uh, multiple providers that want to work together. That's Alice and Bob in the previous picture. Um, and they operate their infrastructure on their, on their own infrastructure or in a public cloud where the, the infrastructure is controlled by them. We call these uh, parties virtual cloud providers and they join uh, together to build what we call a virtual cloud. That virtual cloud offers services and these services can be consumed by any number of clients. Um, <clears throat> the most efficient MPC uh, protocols today, they are working in the so-called offline-online model. Um, the off in the offline phase, they generate so-called correlated randomness. That's kind of, you can think, uh, when you are a racing game fan, this is the nitro that you use to kind of uh, boost your car to drive uh, very fast. And this is exactly what we are doing with the online phase here. So it generates the nitro that is later on consumed in the online phase for having uh, very efficient and fast calculations. So the, the important uh, parts here is in the offline and in the off online phase, the parties, so the virtual cloud providers, have to communicate all the time. Um, that's uh, a very tough setting in, in multi-cloud settings, but uh, that is how secure multi-party computation uh, protocols work. And in addition, you have, in the, especially in the offline phase, you have massive communication requirements. So we are talking about uh, gigabytes of data per second that has to be exchanged between the clouds uh, for, uh, for uh, doing the computations. So that influences how uh, Carbon Stack looks like on the, on the architectural level. We have at the moment four services, and two of them are for the, for the offline phase, and two of them are for the online phase. One of them each is for storing um, data, and the other one is for processing or generating the data. So we have Castor, that's a service that stores this Nitro, uh, and this Nitro is generated by the, the Klischko service. And later on, um, in, the, in the online phase, you can store your data in an object store that is called, in our case, Amphora, which is um, a secret store. So what it contains is not plain data, but encrypted data. And we have Ephemeral, which is uh, the computing services, uh, so which implements actually the serverless paradigm. How all of this works together is uh, like the following. So in the first step, uh, Alice and Bob, in that case, would kind of uh, in, um, start a binding process where they jointly create some cryptographic keys. As soon as this is done, the, the Klischko services here in step two start um, running the offline phase uh, and generating these uh, correlated randomness that is then stored in, in Castor for later use. Um, later on, the clients can then 
connect to the, to the virtual cloud built by Alice and Bob and can consume the services. And these services they consume are actually storage services uh, Amphora and uh, uh, compute service Ephemeral. And Amphora um, um, and, and the Ephemeral use that correlated randomness generated during the offline phase, as I said, for doing the computations on top of it. So the high-level view on the, on the stack as a, as a layered architecture looks like this. So what I've told you so far is this red uh, layer called the Carbine Stack Foundation Services. And on top of that, because that's a little bit tedious to use sometimes, we want to have higher layer uh, functionality, which is data analytics in our case and federated learning. You may have heard of that. Uh, data analytics is clear, but federated learning is a means of uh, doing, for example, machine learning training based on data that doesn't have to leave the, the premises of the, of the data owner. And um, on top of that, we then want to implement our use cases. But what is more interesting today is what is beyond, uh, uh, below that, that Carbine Stack Foundation services, and that's the cloud native basis that we use. In particular, we use Kubernetes for kind of getting the scalability and also the resiliency that comes with it, also the operation, operations capabilities that it has. Uh, we use Knative uh, to allow our users, so Carbine Stack users, to concentrate on their code, which is MPC code and not on the infrastructure, uh, which means all the auto-scaling uh, is done by, by Knative in our case. And then finally, we have Istio as a component here for the one thing is required by Knative, but um, in addition, we as you have understood probably from the last slides, networking is very, very important here, and we have to clearly understand what is happening in the stack to avoid any bottlenecks here, and Istio helps a lot here with its observability uh, guarantees, and it's, uh, in terms of security, also its transparent uh, uh, the, uh, network encryption capabilities. Okay, that was very abstract, so let's now dive a, dive a little bit uh, deeper into how we actually use Knative for implement our ephemeral serverless computing service. So what you can see here is the typical setup that you <coughs> have when using um, Knative. You have uh, on the Istio layer, you have a virtual service that exposes the service to, the, to, uh, to clients that want to call um, the, the function. Uh, then you have the function container itself, which contains your business uh, logic, and you have a proxy in front of it that queues the incoming calls and uh, uh, makes sure to uh, send the uh, consumption metrics to a component called the activator, which uh, then, and, and the autoscaler, which makes sure that uh, you can um, scale the system based on the load and also scale to zero in case there is no load uh, available. So our case is special because I said that the virtual um, um, the virtual cloud providers have to communicate during the computation all the time, and that's not supported by Knative. You can exactly open up one port uh, to the outside, which is the HTTP port. So we had to extend that um, in a way that allows us to also have these TCP channels between all the participating VC, uh, VPCs to. Um, to do, to do their job, and that's the reason why we introduced uh, a CRD, a custom resource definition, and an associated controller that is able to establish what we call these MPC networks, so the uh, mutual TCP connections to execute the MPC protocol. So we have that network controller listening for uh, network CRDs and then configures Istio in the required way so that the, um, the Knative containers can actually connect to each other. But before being able to connect, they have to first uh, understand to, who they, to whom they should talk. Um, so you can have hundreds of function containers deployed in a single system and you have to make sure that uh, the, the containers belonging to the same execution actually can find each other. And for that reason, we introduced the discovery service that is also exposed over HTTP to the other VCPs. And the local function container registers itself using its endpoint on that, on that um, dis discovery registry, and uh, that gets exposed to the, uh, to the, to the others. Uh, in the next step, the client will then actually invoke the function. Uh, which, which means there is an incoming HTTP request. So let's assume that we have at least one instance of the function pod available at the moment. So the, the request is just forwarded to the function container. <coughs> and what then happens is it queries the registry for the other endpoints to be able to start the MPC engines. 
Um, and then uh, as soon as this is done, the function container will fetch the data from uh, our object store called M4 as input to the computation, will perform the, the computation, and then later on uh, will store the, the results back into M4. And uh, during this, they will consume the correlated randomness from, from Castor. Yeah, and uh, since we have Knative as the enabling framework here, we can uh, rely on its auto-scaling capabilities for making sure that our MPC workloads are scaled automatically um, as required by the current workload situation. Okay, then uh, talking what's next. Um, as I said, there is a lot of uh, performance overhead still uh, um, in, in these technologies, and we want to reduce that. What is of particular interest here is a little bit surprising network communication cost. So when you look at the, at the pricing models of the public cloud providers, you see you don't pay typically for ingress, but you pay a lot for egress. And uh, since we are communicating gigabytes per second uh, for each of, of these offline phases, that's a huge cost factor. And uh, we are working together with academic, academic partners to bring that overhead uh, that comes from, or that cost that comes from, from this part of the system down by orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude, a factor of, of 1,000. Um, that's a, a, a big uh, yeah, task that we have at the moment, but we have uh, clear ideas how to solve that. The second thing you saw that al already on the, on the uh, slide on the, on the layered architecture, so we want, at the moment, we have, uh, we have this kind of infrastructure as a service layer called uh, Carbine Stack Foundation Services, but we want to add additional services on top of that that deliver more value to customers and are more easy to use. So for using the Carbine Stack Foundation Services, you have to have a basic understanding of how MPC works. Uh, which is not the case for these higher level services. For, for example, for data analytics, we are uh, working together with a partner to implement a database management system based on MPC on top of the foundation layer so that people using it can, can just use their regular SQL uh, uh, tools and, and language to, to query that system, which will uh, remove the need to understand what is happening uh, um, underneath. Uh, then we will add uh, authentication and authorization, also based on cloud native technology. So at the moment, our plans are to use OPA and DEX here. So OPA for having a flexible uh, policy engine to allow for different kinds of access policies for uh, depending on, on the use case that we want to realize and DEX for OIDC authentication. So this will allow us to define exactly who is allowed to do what in the system when it comes to, for example, um, query data from the Amphora object store. And um, the final thing is we want to investigate and use the, the operator framework for actually deploying, configuring, and operating a Carbine Stack virtual cloud provider. It's a rather complex uh, thing, so we think that tooling is uh, necessary to, to operate this. We already started doing that, so that, that Klischko service that implements the computation layer of the offline phase is already based on the operator pattern. Um, so you basically can uh, deploy jobs generating correlated randomness using uh, custom resource definitions um, by means of a controller that uh, initiates all the required processes. Okay, so in summary, um, you have heard about PPCTs. What is this? What is the relevance for the industry? There is a lot of momentum behind it. Um, what I didn't say is that, uh, for example, there is a prediction from, from the Confidential Computing Consortium that the growth of these technologies uh, will be up to 95% until, so uh, compound annual growth rate um, until 2026, creating a $50 billion market um, around confidential computing. Um, secure multi-party computation is one specific privacy-preserving computing technology that has very strong security guarantees and allows for end-to-end -end encrypted data uh, pipelines. Um, it has uh, a lot of requirements on the underlying uh, infrastructure, in particular because it has, it has to ensure that parties can communicate uh, across cloud boundaries all the time. And uh, yeah, with Carbine Stack, our, our mission is to establish an enterprise grace MPC framework that can be used by all those that have similar needs like Bosch uh, when it comes to establishing trust with their customers, being compliant with regulations and um, uh, collaborate with, with their partners. 
yeah, so you are all invited if you are interested uh, to join our effort. Uh, we have a website, uh, carbinestack.io, uh, that describes the system and also has tutorials how this can be deployed. Uh, we have a GitHub organization, of course, um, where you are very welcome to uh, submit issues if you find any or uh, submit PRs. And there is also a Discord server where we uh, kind of uh, answer all community questions and also have our regular uh, community meetings. Okay, with that said, that's it. Are there any questions? Thank you.